So this is the new Foreigner 965, and this could be one of the best blends of features, functionality, and looks that Garmin's come out with yet. And you could very well think of this as a 955 with an AMOLED display, which it very well is because it has the same GPS chipset, heart rate sensor, processor, memory, and all that good stuff. But you could also sort of think of this as kind of like an Epix Lite because it adds a premium touch over the 955 with many of the same features of the Epix with the same kind of AMOLED display, but actually an even larger AMOLED display. Now, before we get into all the details about this new Foreigner 965, it actually isn't the only new watch that Garmin's coming out with today, so they're also releasing the new Foreigner 265, which is essentially an AMOLED version of their Foreigner 225 music, but there are a couple new things that they've added to the 265 too, so I've got another full in-depth review of the 265, which I'll have linked down in the description below. And I know some of you out there are probably curious about the differences between the Foreigner 265 and this new 965, and don't worry, I've got another full in-depth comparison for you two of these two watches, so go ahead and check out those videos once you're done over here. So last year, we saw Garmin's Phoenix lineup get an AMOLED version of that sports watch, that being the Garmin Epix. And this time around, they're bringing around the Foreigner 965 and the 265, which are AMOLED versions of the Foreigner 955 and 255, which also came out last year. And I'd have to argue that the Epix kind of made a big splash because the Phoenix lineup has had memory and pixel or transflected displays for years and years. And same thing goes for Foreigners. They've had tried and true transflected displays forever, with those displays having some distinct advantages for outdoor sports, namely very good readability outside, especially in bright conditions, but they also don't consume much power, so you could get battery life into the weeks or the months depending on the watch. The nice thing though about what Garmin's done with these AMOLED displays is that they've been able to deliver quite decent battery life out of them with their Venue series as well as their Epics. Not quite what you can get out of a transflected display, but much better than other smartwatches with similar display technologies like an Apple Watch or a Samsung Watch. And based on the popularity of the Epix and Venue series, they're now introducing the Foreigner 265 and 965 with the same sort of AMOLED displays. But with the 965, it's actually the largest AMOLED display they have yet at 1.4 inches. That's right, that's actually larger than the 1.3 inch display on the Epix. And it's actually the same dimensions as the Phoenix 7X or Enduro 2. But since the 965 uses an AMOLED display, you're getting even more pixels and much more detail on all parts of the interface. The Epix display is already a very good display with 416 by 416 pixels but the 965 display being slightly larger has a whopping 454 by 454 pixels. And you'll, you'll really notice those extra pixels, especially with maps. And when compared with the 955, well, there's certainly going to be a difference comparing the 260 by 260 transflected display on the 955 versus the display on the 965. And of course, with all those extra pixels, you'll be able to see emojis in all their full glory. When it comes to readability, transflected displays certainly do have their place, especially outdoors where they really are great, especially in bright sunlight, but the 965 display is still really good because it gets really bright. There can be a little bit of glare at some angles, but overall it doesn't really affect readability all that much. The nice thing is, is that you do have either display option, of course, with the 955 or the 965, and, and I actually went through a lot of the benefits and drawbacks with each kind of display technology in a recent video where I compared the Garmin Epix to the Garmin Phoenix 7. But what you also notice here too is that they revamped the interface a bit on the 965 from both the Venue as well as the Epix. I mean, the user interface and the Epix and Venue are good and all, but they've taken a lot more advantage of all those extra pixels with this display by having an incredible amount of detail detail and a lot more animation throughout. And along with the interface, they really kind of went nuts with the new watch faces on the 965. I'd actually have to argue that these are some of the best looking stock watch faces I've seen so far. And just to give you an idea of all the stock watch faces that are available, I'll just kind of scroll through all of them now and just feel free to pause to check any of these out. And then just like the Epix and the Venue series with their AMOLED displays, the 965 also comes with an optional always-on display mode, which works with both the watch faces as well as during workouts, so you'll easily be able to take a glance at your watch without having to turn your wrist, but that does take a bit more in terms of battery life. Which I guess now is a good time to talk about battery life. So these bright AMOLED displays are incredible to look at with all these vibrant colors, but one drawback to these kinds of displays is that they do consume more battery life than the memory and pixel or transflected display technology that's found on the 955, but somehow Garmin was actually still able to pull off some very decent battery life out of the 965 with up to 23 days in smartwatch mode if you're not using the always on display. And if you enable the always on display, they say that you can get around seven days out of it. But for a real life example, I was able to get about six, actually almost seven days out of it while using the always on display. 
I had gesture mode enabled. I had it on the lowest brightness setting for general use, and then I had it on the two thirds brightness setting for during workouts. Plus I also enabled blood oxygen saturation tracking during sleep. And then I did plenty of workouts during that time period. And I was actually using the highest accuracy setting for GPS using the dual band side light system mode. For an outdoor example, so before I left on this ride, I was at 65% and after a two hour and 45 minute ride using the always on display mode at two thirds brightness, and was also using the highest accuracy dual band side light system mode, there's 54% remaining. So it used roughly 11% on that ride. And if we do this simple math, it comes out to about 4% per hour, meaning that in theory, I could get up to about 24 to 25 hours out of it for recording an outdoor activity in that setting. And that actually far exceeds their claim of 19 hours, which is the same claim as the 955. However, the 955 does get longer battery life with the GPS only mode. Compared to the Epics though, without using the always on display, the 965 actually gets quite a bit more battery life, but when using the always on display mode, it's actually in similar territory with seven days on the 965 and six days on the Epics for general use. And overall, I'd have to say that the battery life is pretty impressive out of the 965, and that's both for general use as well as outdoor use. And the reason for the longer battery life, by the way, is that they basically cramped a really big battery into the 965 while keeping it pretty slim. And the 965 uses the same standard Garmin charging port as the 955, but it actually now comes with a USB-C type cable versus the previous USB type A. Oh, and side note, I also did tons of charging tests with this nearest USB-C cable, and there's essentially no difference, unfortunately, when it comes to charging times. I tried it with a bunch of watches and the charging times were nearly all identical. Now, along with the new AMOLED display, the 965 also has a touchscreen. So again, kind of just blending the best of both worlds into this watch, where for sports and workouts, you've got the tried and true physical buttons, which longtime foreigner users are used to, where they simply work better during sports. But then you have the touchscreen whenever you want to use that, like the rest of the day, like swiping through widgets or longer menus. In addition, that touchscreen is actually quite usable on the maps page during outdoor activities, where that touchscreen functionality is super useful for panning and browsing around the maps. And that's definitely a sports scenario where the touchscreen really comes in handy. And just like the 955, the Epix, and the Phoenix 7, what they've done here with the touchscreen is that they've given you the choice of how and when you want to use it, where nearly all the functions of the physical buttons can also be done with the touchscreen and vice versa. And if you're just more of a fan of physical buttons and don't want to use the touchscreen at all, you can disable it. And that's both on a global level as well as a per activity level. So like here, you could very well have touchscreen functionality for something like hiking, but you could turn it off for trail running. Oh, and really quick, if you're finding the information in this video useful, do me a favor and just quickly hit that like button. It's a small little thing that you can do that'll help this video and the channel quite a bit, and I appreciate it. Another nice addition with the 965 is that it comes with a titanium bezel, which certainly adds a premium touch to it. I mean, the 955 is a good looking watch and all, but the titanium bezel really does elevate the 955 a bit in terms of looks and is another reason why it gets a little bit closer to something like the Garmin Epix. The 965 uses Gorilla Glass 3 to protect the display, and you'll also notice that slightly curved at the edges, which is a little bit different than the completely flat displays on the 955 as well as the Epix. And in terms of durability, the Gorilla Glass 3 has held up just fine with all my testing. But if you are looking for the most durability, you may want to look at something like the Epic Sapphire. However, that does come at a much higher cost. Another difference is that the 965 is just a smidge larger than the 955 in regards to the case diameter, where it has a 47.2 millimeter case versus the 46.5 millimeter case on the 955. And the 965 case actually is quite similar to the Epix, by the way, at 47 millimeters. What's nice though about the 965 is that they were able to reduce the thickness by over a millimeter, where the 965 is around 14 and a half millimeters thick, and the 955 is a little bit over 15 and a half millimeters thick, and that's including the heart rate sensor, by the way. Without the heart rate sensor, the 965 is around 13.3 millimeters thick, and the 955 is around 14.3 millimeters thick. And then for comparison, the Epix is around 15.7 millimeters thick with the heart rate sensor and 14.5 millimeters thick without the heart rate sensor. And then for weight, the 965 comes in right around 36 grams for the case itself and a little under 53 grams for the total weight with the band. For comparison, the 955 Solar weighs virtually the same at 36 grams for the case and then a little over 53 grams with the band. And then the Epix case weighs around 47 grams and the total weight of the Epix with the band weighs around 70.7 grams. And for wearability, I actually quite like these dimensions for my 185 millimeter circumference wrist. For me, I've always preferred the 47 millimeter case option on the Epix and the mid-size Phoenixes to be just about right, but I also noticed the thickness and also the weight on those on occasion. And with the 965, I actually like the slightly larger case than the 955, along with that awesome 1.4 inch display, of course, but I also really appreciated how they reduced the thickness. That thinner case really does make it nice, especially with sleeves, where it just makes life a little bit easier and being lighter than the Epix, another reason that you can kind of think about it as an epic light.
Now the 965 only does come in one size though, which may make it less appealing for those of you out there with smaller wrists. So that's where you may need to consider the slightly smaller 955 or even the 265, which comes in two different sizes. But the 265 doesn't come with maps and a few other features, which I go over all those differences in my 265 versus 965 video. The band that comes on the 965 is a slightly new design than the 955 and it has this kind of duotone look to it and also has a little accent on the end of the strap. These aren't necessarily industry standard straps, however, the 965 actually is compatible with Garmin's Quick Fit 22 bands. So what you have to do here to make this work is that you just remove the stock watch band that comes with the 965, and you have to use some sort of tool that's designed to remove watch band pins, reinsert the pin back into the case, and then you can just pop on a Quick Fit band like this one that I have from the Garmin Epix. And then on the training feature side of things, so just like the 955 and the Epix, the 965 comes with a ton of training and performance feedback features where it can track your VO2 max for running and cycling. It has a race predictor for common running and race distances. You get training status, which is based on numerous factors, including your VO2 max trends, your HRV status, and acute load. Plus you also get training readiness, which takes into account your sleep, recovery time, HRV status, acute load, sleep history, and stress history to assess how you ready you are for your next workout. But a new feature that's coming out with the 965 is a new load ratio figure. So what this does is it compares your acute load or short-term training load over the last week or so with your chronic load, which is your long-term training load over the last month or so. So basically it's saying how your most recent training compares to your longer term training. So like here, you can see that I haven't been training quite as much this week compared to what I've done in weeks past. Oh, and the load ratio feature as well as the altitude acclimation updates will be coming to other higher end models like the 955, the Phoenix 7 and Epix later this year via software update. Something else new is that now you'll be able to collect advanced running dynamics like vertical oscillation, vertical ratio, and ground contact time without having an accessory. Previously, to get these metrics, you actually had to wear an accessory like the HRM Pro heart rate strap, but now it collects all those metrics from the watch itself. One thing to note here though, is that the only metric that isn't calculated by the watch itself is ground contact time balance, and that's where you'll need an HRM Pro or an RD pod. And related to that, another thing that's sort of new, at least from when the 955 was first released, is that the 965 collects wrist-based running power, but this was something that was actually added to the 955 since it was first launched. And then on the health and wellness tracking side of things, it tracks your heart rate, of course. It tracks your SpO2 or blood oxygen saturation levels. It also has Garmin's advanced sleep tracking with sleep stages. It also tracks your HRV or heart rate variability, but just note that it does not have the necessary hardware for ECG like on the Venue 2 Plus. And then on the sport profile side of things, just like the 955, you get pretty much anything that you can think of from all the common activities like running both outside and inside, cycling profiles including road biking, mountain biking and gravel biking, indoor cycling with the ability to pair with smart bike trainers, pool swimming and open water swimming, triathlon and multi-sport modes, plenty of gym profiles, lots of outdoor recreation profiles like skiing and snowboarding, indoor climbing as well as bouldering, as well as stuff like tennis, golf, stand-up paddleboarding, and even disc golf. Where the 965 differs though when compared to the Epix is that it currently doesn't have a few activity profiles that are found in the Epix, namely the kiteboard profile, the windsurf profile, surfing, adventure racing, as well as expedition. And the 965 also comes with full-blown topo and landscape maps just like the 955, but the big difference here is that the maps look pretty amazing with this AMOLED display where there's just tons of contrast and the details just pop with all those pixels. And then similar to the 955 as well as the Epic Sapphire, the 965 has 32 gigabytes of storage which can be used for both maps as well as music. Oh, and yep, the 965 also does have support for offline music storage and playback without your phone with music services like Spotify, Deezer, and Amazon Music, and you can store up to 2,000 songs of the watch itself. And then on the GPS side of things, the 965 comes with the same dual band satellite chipset as the 955 as well as the Epic Sapphire where it can access five different satellite systems, but along with that, it can also access two different satellite frequencies at one time. And what's nice about the 965, just like the 955 and the Epic Sapphire is that it also has their auto select or sat IQ option. So what this does, instead of always putting it into their highest accuracy setting, which takes more battery, you can use the auto select or sat IQ option. And what this does is automatically switch between satellite modes. So if it senses less of a quality satellite signal, it can switch from a single frequency mode to a dual frequency mode and vice versa, which results in battery life savings. Now for the GPS test that I have for you, I actually wanted to see how accurate it was using the highest accuracy setting compared to some of the other devices. So I had it locked into the dual band mode for all of these tests. But if you want to get an idea of the auto select or sat IQ accuracy versus dedicated dual band, I actually have a video where I went over all that with the Garmin Enduro 2 versus the Chorus Vertex 2, which I'll have that video linked down in the description below. So in regards to accuracy on this run here, all good stuff on the 965. It lined up perfectly in regards to the total distances compared to the other devices I was using that also have the dual band satellite chipsets. 
And then for the finer detail of the GPS tracks, what you can see here from a high level is that all the devices really did fine here. But if we zoom in, we start to see some differences. So what I really want to point out is over here when I was on some curvier paths, and we see that the 965 was, in the whole scheme of things, the most accurate of the bunch, where it was tracking nearly exactly where I was on the path. It was actually really impressive how well it tracked along these sections. And then for a longer example, here's a road ride. And again, the 965 was right in line with all the other test devices. And then I also wanted to point out that the elevation gain collected with the barometric altimeter was also pretty much spot on with Strava's corrected elevation figure, as well as the other devices. So all good stuff there. And again, if we take a look at the finer detail of the GPS tracks, quite good to go. And you can even see on some of these out and back sections on the same road, it was easily able to distinguish between one side of the road versus the other. Really, the only thing I could barely nitpick on is that it swept this faster corner just a little bit wide, but that's basically the only thing I could find in all the tests that was even slightly off. All in all, very accurate for GPS. And then I also wanted to quickly go over how well the 965 did in regards to estimating distances running indoors on a treadmill. And as you can see from this run here, it matched up very closely to this treadmill, which I found to be pretty accurate. And then for heart rate accuracy, the 965 shares the same fourth generation elevated heart rate sensor as the 955. And I had extremely good results with the 955 and the 965, well, it really wasn't any different. So for running, here's kind of a boring steady state run. And as you can see, the 965 all but nailed it over the course of the entire run. If I had to nitpick about anything, right here at the beginning, it took maybe 20 seconds or so to lock on a heart rate, but that's kind of typical for a wrist-based optical heart rate sensor at the beginning of a workout. But after that, it didn't really falter one bit. And then moving on to some indoor cycling, well, this is essentially perfect. And this even had plenty of rapid changes in heart rate during some intervals. I mean, this is kind of a thing of beauty. Now with road biking outside, it starts to introduce a lot more variables for a watch to deal with, like vibrations and bumps in the road, which can throw off these kinds of sensors. But as you can see, the 965 was pretty respectable here. You'll definitely notice a bit more shakiness here and there where it's not as exact as that indoor ride that we saw earlier, but that's about to be expected. And then I did notice that in a couple of these spots where I stopped and restarted, it tracked a little bit low for a moment or two, but other than that, this is a pretty good result for road biking. So this new Forner 965, well, honestly, I think it's a pretty killer combination of all the sports functionality of their highest end Forner, the same type of gorgeous AMOLED display that's found on the Epix and Venue 2 Plus, but it's actually a little bit larger, and a more premium look with that titanium bezel. To me, this actually kind of sits in between the 955 and the Epix. It may not have the durability of the Epix, but for those of you who live without the Sapphire lens option and a bit more metal in the construction, but still want a super capable watch with an awesome display for a much lower price tag than the Epix, I don't know. I think I think this can be kind of hard to go wrong with the 965 and personally I actually really enjoyed my time with this watch. Now in terms of price the 965 comes in at $599 which is $100 more than the standard Foreigner 955 but the same price as the 955 Solar. Considering the titanium bezel and the slightly more premium look along with the AMOLED display and some very respectable battery life I think that's actually a pretty reasonable cost. What's great though is that the 955 isn't going away or anything like that so for those of you who prefer transfective displays that option's totally there but for those of you who want the bright and crispy option, well, there you go. And yeah, if you have any questions about the 965 that I didn't cover in this video, make sure to leave those in the comment section down below. And on your way down there, if you found the information in this video to be useful, do me a favor and also hit that like button. And if you're interested to know what the 265 is all about, I've got my full in-depth review of this watch, as well as my full in-depth comparison of the 265 versus the 965, which I'll have linked down in the description below. In the meantime, happy running, happy riding, or whatever else you like to do, and we will see you in the next video.